Hey there YouTube, how you guys doing today? We're here on my website, I just want to let you guys know Steamboat still has not erupted, it is still at the tie, but the last eruption was August 20th, and usually if it adheres to its normal schedule, it erupts every 6 to 7 days, and right now it's 4.10pm Pacific Time, August 26, 2019, so we could see it in the next 24 to 48 hours, I'm thinking it probably will happen tonight or tomorrow morning. So just keep an eye out on my Steamboat Geyser page if you guys want to see the plots. I always update it right when I see a Steamboat Geyser eruption occur. I always try to do it as fast as I possibly can just for those monitoring Steamboat out there. Again, the last eruption was on August 20th. It's August 26th right now. And the last eruption was the 32nd eruption, making it a tie for 2018 and 2019 for the all-time yearly records. And we're about to beat it in less than a day, I believe, guys. Now, going to my Seismo blogs, Hawaii, I did put out a new post, just letting you guys know, about the recent swarming, just a few things about the recent swarming in Pahala, Hawaii, deep within the mantle, well, not deep within the mantle, but it's definitely deep underneath Hawaii, occurring right where spasmodic tremor occurs. I don't know why my computer's taking so long with this. Give it a second. So yeah, just go to my Hawaii blog. You can take a look at this if you want. Just a Pahala earthquake swarm which was occurring where the spasmodic tremor occurs, likely within the mantle plume conduit. Don't know exactly which conduit it is or where that conduit is headed. I do show a few plots to some of the events, but you can primarily see all the earthquakes on the heli quarter plots from TRAD, which is one of my favorite stations to use in Hawaii, especially when, especially when dealing with uh, deep mantle earthquakes. Very interesting right there. And I do show the recent spasmodic tremor. There were only a few of them. Sorry guys, my internet is acting very slow right now. But the strongest one was event 4 that I labeled right here. And there should be text right here. I don't know why there is not. Uh oh. Looks like I gotta update that. Whoopsie. I made a mistake. See, even I make mistakes, guys. And there's also 4.2 under Luihi, excuse me, Seamount Volcano. Just under the southern flank, and I show the plots right there, and quickly, very briefly talk about that. Now let's move on to two things in this video. I'm going to talk about whale calls. You're probably saying, what? Ben, whale calls? What does that have to do with anything? Well, I'm going to talk about that last, because probably not everybody's going to want to hear about that. It's about whale calls being detected on seismic stations off our coast underwater. And it's pretty interesting, guys. This was brought up to me by Mike M., and he sent me an email saying that he found some whale calls from some of the seismic stations out there. And I did some research. Very intriguing stuff, especially when you hear the audio. And I'll show you the seismic audio of the whale calls at the end of this video. But first, I want to check out the recent post by Yellowstone Volcano Observatory. Here's the recent Caldera Chronicles, published today, August 26, 2019. Yellowstone's newest thermal area, an up-close and personal visit. I'm going to leave a link to this in the description box below, so you can skip this part if you want to. I'm just going to read this article just real quick, um, so you can just go read it yourself if you want to skip this part. But remember that new thermal area that they talked about earlier this year near West Turn Lake, which is on the, I believe that's the northeast section of the Sour Creek Resurgent Dome, just north-northeast of Yellowstone Lake at Yellowstone Caldera Supervolcano. Well, they had a new thermal area, and we're going to check out what they're writing about it. Earlier this year, an issue of Yellowstone Caldera Chronicles reported on the discovery of an emerging thermal area within Yellowstone National Park. The area was identified in thermal infrared imagery as a region of warm ground that was not in the park's database of known thermal features. It is located along the northeast boundary of the Sour Creek Resurgent Dome near West Turn Lake, and it appears to be an extension of the previously known Turn Lake thermal area. In this image you see right here, guys, Right here is the brand new thermal area. Well, been growing over the past decade or so, but still it's past 10 to 20 years. But still, that's technically new for a thermal area. So it is a baby, all a baby thermal area. And we see West Turn Lake is right here. And the already known thermal area, the Turn Lake thermal area is right there. But yeah, this area is the new one. Now, let's see if it'll close out. A review of archived aerial photos taken by the Department of Agriculture revealed that the thermal area was a hillside of healthy trees in the 1990s. We don't know its exact birthday, but satellite image imagery required, excuse me, acquired in summer 2001 show the first evidence of trees beginning to die. So probably around 2000-2001 is when the thermal area started to grow, guys. By 2006, there is an increasingly large zone of dead or dying trees and a measurable thermal anomaly at the surface. 
by 2009, the ground had the white chalky color that is typical of many other thermal areas in the park. To better understand the characteristics of the new thermal area, a team of USGS and Yellowstone National Park scientists visited the site last week. They mapped the extent of the area, acquired air and ground-based thermal infrared and visible imagery, and took the temperature of the subsurface using a handheld ther thermostore. Thermostore? Okay, that was weird. I thought I was going to say thermometer for a second. There was no water discharge from this new thermal area, but there was an arc-shaped core of warm ground. Huh. 70 to 80 degrees Celsius at the surface. That was covered in fallen trees. This zone was surrounded by cooler ground that was also littered with recently fallen trees. Within the warmest area, there were steam emissions from several points and sulfur crystals lined some of the steaming areas. The ground temperature in these fumaroles was about 92 degrees Celsius, which would be about 198 degrees Fahrenheit. The boiling temperature at that elevation, which at that elevation would be about 8,000 feet. Throughout this zone, just 5 to 10 centimeters below the surface, the temperatures were consistently boiling. The ground was so warm that parts of some fallen trees had actually become charcoal. The sides of fallen trees against the warm ground are baked and blackened, while the sides facing the sky are unburned. In the cooler zone, some parts of the ground were at background temperatures. Amazingly, though, in a few places, ground temperatures of only 77 degrees Fahrenheit we're just a few feet away from temperatures of 198 degrees Fahrenheit. The fallen trees in these cooler regions were unburned and new trees were growing. What? And here you can see what used to be the nice, beautiful forest right there on the hillside. And it's now dead because of the new, 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 new Turn Lake Thermal Area. These observations raise many questions about the formation and evolution of the thermal area. Was a slug of gas released over a broad area, first followed by more localized ground heating? Or did surface warming accompany gas di discharge? Excuse me, sorry, I'm having a trouble, a little bit of trouble talking today, guys, sorry. What killed the trees, the gases, or the heat, or both? And why is the vegetation in some areas already recovering? One hypothesis is that over time, high temperatures were localized around pre-existing weak zones underground, for example, along existing cracks or other geological structures. This progression is the reason that we see a broad area of tree kill now, but boiling temperatures only in the core of the new thermal area. While in this region of the park, the research team also took the opportunity to visit other thermal areas that have long been known, but are seldom visited due to their remote location. Remember guys, people can't trek out there all the time. It's wilderness. Very, very wilderness-y out there, guys. I mean... Some of the hikes, you gotta hike all day just to get to one thermal area. I mean, it's pretty, pretty remote, some of the spots in Yellowstone, guys. It's not just all, oh, we could drive here, oh, we could drive there. No, it's, it's a forest. Mud pots, hot spring pools, and boiling fumaroles characterize these thermal areas, but there are also some zones that have clearly cooled down over time. These areas contain the telltale white hydrothermal mineral deposits, but no longer have elevated temperatures, gases, or hot springs, and young trees are growing. Very interesting. And right here we see an infrared image right here. This is the hot patch. You can see right through here. You notice that. And then here is the image right here. I try to zoom in a little bit. This is the new Turn Lake area, right? The Turn Lake thermal area, excuse me, the new one. And you can see a little bit of steaming right in the center of the photograph right there, right there. And over here again, remember blue and purple is colder. And hot would be, of course, yellow and white. So, very intriguing, guys. Very, very intriguing. Dynamic is the name of the game in Yellowstone, especially when it comes to thermal features, which can change rapidly. Sometimes they heat up, like the Norse Geyser Basin did in 2003, and other times they cool down, which is evident from the countless dead thermal areas. Places of altered whitish ground, but without elevated temperatures or discharge of gas or water. The appearance of the new feature near West Turn Lake is not an indication of heightened volcanic activity, Obviously, because it'd have to be coincided with large increase in seismicity and uplift as well. But rather, as part of the life cycle of Yellowstone's dynamic hydrothermal systems. However, someday, guys, we probably will see some geysers erupt out of here. And the first time a geyser erupts, we I don't think we really know what's going to happen. I mean, this whole area could become a big... Well, not big, but it could become a lake someday. Because other places have had large hydrothermal explosions. Not eruptions, but hydrothermal explosions 
and formed kind of like a crater and then became a little tiny pond or a lake. That does happen from time to time, guys. So that is very possible that it could happen right there sometime in the future. Who knows when? But just keep an eye out for that, because it's possible. We have been lucky to witness the birth of a brand new thermal area, and have been able to collect and visit data and observations early in, it, in its life. Now stay tuned for future issues, blah, 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 blah. Okay, very intriguing, guys. Now let's move on to the last thing of this video. We have a new page on my website, which I did make last night because I was so intrigued by these whale calls under seismic events under whale calls right there. So I'm going to leave a link to this in the description box below. If you want to just quit watching this video and just go read the article and listen to the seismic audio of the whale calls. Yes, there is audio included. Then you can go do that right now if you wish. If not, just stick with me and we'll ponder on through this and I'll show some audio as well. Now, did you know whale calls are detectable via seismic data from underwound, under, ha, 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 excuse me, underwater seismometers? If not, check this out. Seismic audio of each whale call example is included. Right here is a seismometer drilled into hardened lava underneath the ocean. A data recorder is held within the yellow sphere. Image credit John Delaney and Deborah Kelly. Longer than a decade ago, scientists decided to start preparations for the creation of a large underwater seismic observatory off the coast of Washington and Oregon states. This observatory would monitor for undersea earthquakes, potential submarine volcanic eruptions, and any geological t changes that could take place, whether it affects man on shore or not. This observatory still does not seem to be complete. Uh-oh, there's a typo right there. Still does not seem to be complete, but there are already numerous submarine seismic stations available for data download through the typical IRIS database. Much to the surprise of some seismologists, there were some very strange pings in a rhythmic formation, some of which you can be see here, which, uh, which saturated the data obtained from these submarine seismometers. Come to find out, these rhythmic beats were the recorded acoustics from nearby whale populations, likely fin whales. Remember, audio is simply a vibration. There are no microphones attached to the seismometer, however the vibrations are strong enough to be detected and can then be used to research fin whale communication. The Journal of the Acoustical Society of America calls for seismic data to be used as a non-invasive form of monitoring whale populations and their poorly understood migration patterns. Huh, who would have thunk? According to investigator William Willock, over the winter months we recorded a lot of earthquakes but we also had an awful lot of fin whale calls. He went on to state that the fin whale calls, at least to the seismologists, were just kind of a nuisance. Click here, this button right here, to read more from the official University of Washington article. Well, oceanographers are now using seismometers to track whale populations, most notably fin whales, which make up the majority of recent whale calls, some of which will be shown in this post here. They occur primarily every 20 to 25 seconds episodically, but can vary. There are two different types of whale calls that are spotted. There are the typical singlet pa calling patterns and also the doublet calling pattern. You can see this via the spectrogram plots directly below this text. Spectrogram plot of the singlet calling pattern and a doublet calling pattern right down here. Notice that? And there's an earthquake right there. Going forward, click here, this button right here, to visit the publication where I obtained those spectrogram plots. These were not generated by me, but everything else basically on this page was generated by myself using Iris and the program Swarm. Now, let's quickly talk about the doublet pattern. They occur usually with a lower beat and then a higher beat, over and over in rhythmic succession. Since this is of course a living creature communicating, this of course varies and can change dramatically. The lower frequency beat within the doublet pattern, which would be this one right here, you know, lower, 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 higher, higher, higher. The lower frequency beat within the doublet pattern starts at about 15 hertz and ends at about 22 hertz. The high frequency beat within the same doublet pattern starts at about 19 hertz and ends at about 28 hertz. Take a look at this, this spectrogram plot right here, which was generated by yours truly. Note the blatant rhythm of the doublet pattern. This is likely a single fin whale. If multiple fin whales started talking, it would likely appear the same, but much busier. Now, on this page, I will show some quick data pertaining to these whale calls. When I found out what this th uh, that this was even possible, I was very intrigued. Right here is the waveform and frequency content of a single whale call. This was part of a doublet pattern and is the higher frequency of the call. All right, going down, filter, 4 hertz, high pass. Now here is a fin whale. Here is what a fin whale is. 
On this page, data will be shown from seismic station ENWF in the NV network, a broadband station on the ocean floor off the coast of Vancouver Island in Washington State. The location of the station can be shown via the station below. I meant to say the image below. Whoops. Or you could just click here, this button right here, to visit the Iris G map, showing the location of every station in the NV network. The NV network is held by Neptune Canada, an organization of oceanographers. So, how is it possible that an instrument that detects vibrations can detect the calls of whales? First off, it is because audio itself is simply a vibration with varying frequencies. Also, according to Michelle Weir Mueller, please forgive me if I said that wrong, an oceanographer with the UW, the calls are consistent at 190 decibels, which would be 130 decibels in the air. 130 decibels is around the wildness of a jet engine. Wow. That's pretty loud, guys. In the image below, you can see a helicopter plot containing half of the data for August 23rd, 2019. There were a few earthquakes detected on this day, likely smaller than magnitude 2.5, probably around the region of this seismometer. However, almost everything else you see are whale calls. Helicopter filtered through Iris time series using a 4 hertz high pass filter. Wow, guys, look at that. A few microquakes here, 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 and here as well. Basically, everything else is a whale call. Yeah, those are a lot of whale calls, guys. At the end of this page, I will show audio for this entire day. However, directly below, I will show three random whale call episodes, along with the audio, so you can actually hear the whales themselves. This is likely only one whale talking. The first two whale calls I'm going to show are the doublet patterns, and the last whale call is considered the singlet pattern. All, all audio is compressed, sped up, so it is easier for humans to hear. Both the plots and the audio contain a 4 hertz high pass filter to filter out any oceanic microseisms or possible volcanic tremor. I suggest using headphones, but be wary of the volume just in case. Alright, here we go. Now let's go to the second one, right down here. Ready? Isn't that cool, guys? I think that's pretty cool myself when I found this out. And here's the last one. Right. Now, for those interested in seeing the earthquakes that were detected during this day, check out these plots just real quick. Only a few microquakes, pretty small guys, they weren't anything major. But just thought I'd put the plots here, just in case if anyone wanted to see them. And down here, now if you wish to hear the audio for this entire data period, from 0 UTC to 1454 UTC on August 23rd, 2019, listen to the audio below, which is right down here. It's a total of 14 hours and 54 minutes of seismic audio compressed into 24 minutes and 29 seconds. I suggest, really suggest using headphones for this. This is a little bit quieter than the audio I played up here. So that's it for the whale calls, guys. Isn't that pretty, pretty intriguing? I don't know. At least in my opinion, maybe I'm just a nerd for seismology. I guess you know you're a seismology nerd when whale calls being detected on seismic stations get you going crazy. <laughs> Very interesting, guys. Let's see if there's anything crazy that happened while I've been recording. No. As we discussed in my last video, uh, seismicity is ongoing in the Ridge Crescent Coastal Volcanic Field area. Up is continuing there. At least that is what the GPS stations are showing. Nothing really much else. Keep an eye out for Steamboat Geyser. It should erupt tonight or tomorrow morning, I'm guessing, unless it's going to be late. But it should be pretty soon, guys. Hope you guys have a great day. God bless, and I'll see you later.